I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance with Senior Airman Ward Miller and the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh Hutch Jr. laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 78 of Steel City Resistance. My name is Hudson Jr., and I'm located in Brookline, a neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh, and I'm just happy to be here. We're going to do this again. We tried it last week, and we're going to give it a shot and see if we can, uh, can't maintain for an hour this evening. I hope so. Uh, welcome to guests in the chat room. If I can quit hitting that wire, we'll be better off. Uh, last week, ladies and gentlemen, I, I did a story. Uh, it was titled... What was it titled? It was titled Black Iron Man Suit. Uh, and it was uh, written by a conservative patriot, African-American Lloyd Marcus, uh, who really does some riveting pieces on American Thinker. Uh, you need to check that out. The link is on the, on the website. Um, and I, I finished the piece, and I decided, you know what, I want to talk to this person. I want to tell him that, you know, what I did, that I was reading his... Uh, material, and so I sent him an email. Uh, Hello, Lloyd. My name is Hutch Jr. <laughs> I produce a podcast named Steel City Resistance, and I frequently quote or read your writings from American Thinker on my show. You are spot on on your viewpoint concerning black Americans, and I highlighted your recent black Iron Man suit on my latest episode. I hope you don't mind me utilizing your material, sir. And I sent him the audio and video links to the show. Uh, and I said, thanks for all that you do. And he immediately responded, Hi, Hutz Jr. Thanks, brother. My goal is to inform and change minds. So anything that you do furthers my cause. Anything you do to further my cause is greatly appreciated. God bless Lloyd. So thank you, Mr. Marcus. I appreciate that. That was uh, heartfelt, to say the least. Uh, again, thank you. And, and to you, keep up the good work. You really are a... Uh, a brave and inspiring man. Um, I posted on the Facebook page uh, an article. I think it was an American thinker also, but this guy takes so much abuse from liberal, from left-wing African Americans that it's just uh, it's horrible. And, and if if people would listen to him, they'd be so much better off. But anyway, hang in there, Lloyd. Uh, there's a lot of people behind you, and uh, the left is just going to get more and more radical, more and more uh, the, the vitriol that, that comes from their mouths is just, uh, it's amazing, it really is. There's a lot of anger on the socialist side, there really is, and it's, uh, it's gonna become more and more apparent as we go, I'm sure. Uh, that's just uh, guaranteed. Um, now one of the things that's been, that's been running in my mind lately is I've had the opportunity to uh, wear this country's uniform in many different countries across the world. And I've seen uh, governments and countries that uh, are so unlike America. And, and I feel that, that there's words being kicked around uh, without people really appreciating the meaning of them. And, and two of those words are, are freedom and liberty. And they're not just words. They're, they're concepts and, and ideals and conditions uh, that are really slipping away and I watch people talk, even people, even conservatives, um, that just uh, don't realize that the little things, that's how they get you is with the little things. The little, you know, the 20-ounce the pop limit in soda limit in New York City is just, uh, it's ridiculous. You know, things like that. Non, you know, people shutting down smoking, for instance. You know, they just closed down <laughs> Senator Max Baucus from Montana. This guy is a real class act. Uh I'm sure you people know, at least the smokers in the audience, that there's a lot of roll-your-own uh, small businesses that have hired uh, thousands of people over the last year or so. And uh, Max Bach is, uh, you know, recipient of big tobacco lobby money, uh, recently spearheaded a, a redefining moment in the transportation bill 
uh, where they redefined what manufacturing means so they could capture this uh, small business, these entrepreneurs that, that buy these $30,000 rolling machines and let you come into the store and you actually roll the cigarettes yourself. But And that's how it, the injunction was. Uh, they, they had originally... Uh, taken it to court and the judge stopped it because of that because the manufacturing uh, it's it's the definition of whether or not that the companies the actual storefronts are doing the manufacturing and the way that you do it is they have the customers put the tobacco in and put the whatever in you know you you do all the all the work and you just rent the machine but no Max Bach has got it changed so they are all shut down a couple days ago they had to close down nationwide it's just crony capitalism it's disgusting but anyway, that happened, and, and that's a liberty being taken away, and a freedom being taken away. And uh, with Obamacare, I mean, it, we, you ain't seen nothing yet, uh, and we're going to get into that as we go here. Um, so anyway, I just just wanted to, over the Independence Day weekend, I was thinking about it and how how really good we have it here, even though the Constitution is almost uh, not even being adhered to now. I mean, and. Many of you know that. You've written to me about it, and I know it. Um, and we really need to get back to that. We do. I think uh, our food supply is so abundant, and our electricity and everything. We just have everything where a lot of people don't even pay attention, and they take all this for granted. They think this is, this is the way it is everywhere, and that is not the case. That is absolutely not the case. Uh, but hopefully enough of us will be able to uh, override this storm. Uh, I, I, see, I seriously hope so. I mean, it's uh, we got one shot left, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to thank 100 million patriots standing from Logan, Ohio on Freedom Connector. That's a pretty nice size organization. And through my stats and everything, I uh, can see that some people from Freedom Connector are, are listening to the show or watching the show. So I want to thank you guys. That's a group on uh, Freedom Connector. Uh, I also want to thank The Right Scoop. Uh, the I don't have the resources to personally go report on things, so 95% of the material that I use, I have I have received it at other other sites and other sources. And the Right Scoop is a website that that is also it's a news aggregator that's on uh, listed on the uh, blog roll at steelcityresistance.wordpress.com, and everything that I post from there, uh, I give them a hat tip and, and provide a link at the bottom of the video. But the right scoop uh, seems to be doing the best, the best job at capturing Representative Alan West material, which uh, we have grown to love. Uh, so the reason that disproportionate amount of material is posted to the website from the right scoop is A, because they're the best, and uh, they have a lot of Alan West material. So you guys keep, keep up the good work also at the right scoop. You're doing a, an outstanding job. And I appreciate you not having a problem with me sharing your material, and I'll always give you credit for it. Uh, now, something that you hear in the media, in the local media, and almost any outlet uh, that's trying to do news seriously or commentary, uh, editorializing things, one of the first things you, that comes out of their mouth is we're, the country is so divided and the Congress is so divided. And, <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, you've got two ideologies combating each other, uh, about 22% of the country admits that they're liberal. And, and I, would, I would like to also just ban the use of the word liberal from now on, because there's no such thing as liberal. This, these are not liberal people. These are leftists. These are people that think the government should run everything. Make no mistake about it. There's no liberal like your grandfather's liberal. These, these people are committed to giving as much power to government at all levels as possible. And I happen to live in a city that's that's governed by the left, and, and they won't even admit it. I mean, it's, uh, you say the word socialism, and they act like you're calling them a, a cartoon character or something, and no, it's what you do. It's how you act. It, it, it's how you think. This is who you are, and you need to uh, <laughs> admit it. 22% uh, are leftists, and the reason that we're so divided is because the media is leftist also. So the media amplifies this small minority of the country into almost majority status. And, and when you're not uh, engaging, 
You know, it's almost a duty to engage in politics. It really is. I think more people need to do it. Um, but if you're not engaged and you're only using the media for entertainment purposes, they, they, they shade every single thing that they do with politics. Do not take my word for it. You, you got to trust me on this. Every single show, I, I drive my wife crazy. Because a show will come on and I'll point out the political statement that the show that has nothing to do with politics is trying to get across. It's subliminal almost and they're, they're embedded and, and you can take almost every single show. When's the last time you saw a show or a movie with a white heterosexual American male being a hero for doing something good for the country? They don't make them. I mean, I went and saw Act of Valor, but that was uh, that had real Navy SEALs in it. Um, but the John Waynes aren't aren't out there anymore. There's always some dysfunctional factor involved in any Hollywood production, and it's just uh, I don't watch it anymore. I very rarely watch anything other than fact-based reporting or or documentaries. And even the documentaries, a lot of them, you have to be careful. Uh, just American hating stuff. It's it's something else. But uh, if that's the only thing you're using the media for, and you're not you don't really care about politics up until the one day that you go to vote and decide the direction that the country's going to go, uh, you're going to probably lean left just out of what you've been exposed to. Uh, thank goodness for AM radio and the internet and Breitbart and Drudge uh, and everybody else because uh, I can I can just. Imagine how this would be if we wouldn't have the reach that we have and, and the uh, ability to tailor our sources uh, to the point where I don't want to see something that's just right wing and, and bashing everybody and, and saying Romney's awesome and all this because, frankly, uh, Romney's in a little bit of trouble with the conservative punditry right now. Uh, a lot of them have been coming out and, and, and trying to get across to them that you can't win this this election by trying to run off run out the clock, which see, is what it seems like he's doing. It seems like he's just playing the prevent defense, and I absolutely disagree with that, and I think he needs to come off the idea that it's just the economy also. It's not just the economy. It's the presidency of the United States. It's the current administration and all its zardom and everything else and its regulatory uh, just binge that, that needs to be dressed up, and it's much more than just the economy. It's liberty and freedom, and, and it's foreign affairs. I mean, the caliphate that everybody made Beck into a, a maniac for is occurring right before our eyes, and we're, we're sanctioning it as the Muslim Brotherhood moves into Egypt, as the Muslim Brotherhood moves into Libya with the elections coming, and the State Department over there granting them regular country status, and the Obama administration welcoming Maury or whatever the president's name in, in uh, Egypt is into the White House. I mean, this is just, this is Alice in Wonderland stuff. I've said it before, and we, we got to get back to, to basics. I mean, we got to get Alan West somewhere besides just a representative from Florida. That man needs to be promoted, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he gets it, and that's something that, uh, that we need right now. So, uh, Moving right along here, I have the wrong paperwork in front of me naturally, that's how I roll. Uh, however, I know where it is. <laughs> Eric tweeted the show, ladies and gentlemen. You can tweet the show uh, using the hashtag SCRPGH. Uh, every now and then, some of those things disappear. I don't know why that is. I mean, they disappear from the, I don't know if there's a time limit on them or, or what, but I did manage to get the ones from Steel City Resistance. I have another show that Eric listens to that he also interacts with. So uh, anyway, Eric tweets, maybe you need to have folks record short segments and put them in a Dropbox for you. And then he mentions another guy and himself. And actually, Eric, if you're listening to the show, go check your email. I sent you an email about that, and you didn't respond in time uh, for the show. Uh, he also tweeted in response to something I said, if I'm going to be an associate reporter, you need to start talking about the audit the Fed bill. Okay, fair enough. He also sent an email to the show uh, that uh, shows a response from the Campaign for Liberty to Eric. Dear Eric, Congressman Ron Paul's audit the Fed bill will be voted on in the U.S. House this July. 
Thanks to the hard work of campaign for liberty, campaign for liberty activists like you, Americans are waking up to the Fed's secretive operations and the many problems it causes in our economy. But while the prospects for passage of audit the Fed have never been greater, it's now entering a very dangerous stage. Now is the time when the Fed's allies will do everything in their power to water the bill down and leave a meaningless shell behind or kill it outright. Don't let them get away with it. Audit the Fed currently enjoys the support of a majority of the U.S. House, but you and I know from experience that nothing can be taken for granted. In fact, today, seven Pennsylvania representatives still refuse to co-sponsor Audit the Fed. Why are the following representatives refusing to stand for transparency and accountability at our nation's central bank? Robert Brady, Shaka Fatah, oh, there's a good one, Mark Kritz, Allison Schwartz, Mike Doyle from Pittsburgh. Uh, incidentally, Mike Doyle, uh, it was in his office that uh, Stupak was convinced that uh, they wouldn't have any abortions on the, in the Obamacare Act. Uh, Joseph Pitts and Tim Holden. If your representative is included in the above list, please call them immediately to demand they stand with the American people by co-sponsoring H.R. 459, the Audit the Fed bill. And it goes on. And uh, my main point in bringing that uh, to you people is that good job, Eric. I mean, he, he believes in something, and he's out there, and he's doing something about it. And uh, that's what we all need to do. If we truly need, if we truly want to get our country back closer to the Constitution and closer to sanity, it's not going to happen by itself. You have to you have to pick candidates that you like and you have to support them. If you don't have any money, then support them with some time, or support them by talking to your friends about them. But you absolutely have to get involved. This isn't a time uh, where we can just sit back and, and just let everything play out and let there be a popularity contest in November. Because I'll tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, you've seen it before and you're going to see it again. The Democrats are going to cheat. They're going to cheat. Understand that. Make no mistake about that. It's what they do. With 22% of the population calling themselves liberal, it's the only way they can win. The only way. Now, Scott Walker did a good job out in Wisconsin, uh, you know, trying to unplug this, this uh, big labor machine, uh, transferring people's money into Democrat campaign coffers and providing uh, phony protesters that don't even know what they're protesting, paying them 60 bucks a day to go out there and carry signs. They can't even read half of them. Uh, so let's get out there and do what we can uh, to get freedom and liberty reinstated in this country. Uh, there's a, a lot of things are going on right now that are pretty bizarre. And uh, in all actuality, the Fed, that was Woodrow Wilson's dream. Uh, he approved that. So... Uh, this is just the progressive mission rolling right along, as I talked about last week. Um, let's see your monthly jihad report. For June 2012, 192 jihad attacks in 24 countries against five religions, leaving 1,173 dead bodies, 2,266 critically injured. The religion of peace, ladies and gentlemen, one body at a time. Now, today's tonight's first story uh, is going to, it really jumped out, and that's the reason that it's the first story this evening. Uh, we all know about the Obamacare ruling in the Supreme Court and Justice Roberts uh, bowing down to political pressure and, and you know, a little bit of, of fear and cowardice on his part, uh, you know, letting a, a bill stand that is clearly unconstitutional, and he knows it. Uh, but but I want you to this this next segment is uh, it's the path to Obamacare. It's it's all the things that had to happen for Obamacare to pass and to be uh, deemed constitutional by the Supreme Political Court. Uh, Obamacare's hideous history recounted, and this is stunning because we we saw this all happen, but. Seeing it all in one document, everything that had to happen chronologically in one document just makes your head spin. And then you turn around and you hear politicians lie about the uh, bipartisan way this was passed. And it's just like, truth doesn't even matter anymore. Obamacare's hideous history recounted. 
Amid, uh, the, and then a the byline, this law remains utterly illegitimate. Amid John Roberts' craven surrender to the political branches on Obamacare, a bizarre capitulation at that, since Roberts honored a statute that he hallucinated, but neither Congress nor the president authored nor authorized. Americans should remember just how many rules, standards, and traditions had to be twisted or bulldozed in order for the Unaffordable Care Act to become law. For Obamacare to be enacted in the first place required each of more than a dozen highly unlikely or even suspect occurrences or actions. It then took some serious constitutional hocus-pocus for it to survive in court. Consider the awful lit litany. First, rogue prosecutors, drunk with bloodlust, had to break all sorts of rules in order to secure the conviction of Alaska's U.S. Senator Ted Stevens. Stevens, in his hubris, also had to insist on a speedy trial he thought would clear his name before the election of 2008, when in fact it resulted in the conviction that sealed his electoral fate. Also, Judge Emmett Sullivan, a no-nonsense jurist, had to decide not to declare a mistrial before the verdict, despite growing evidence of prosecutorial misconduct. Sullivan didn't necessarily err, he just didn't have enough proof of misconduct yet. When it came post-trial, he cracked down fairly hard on the scoff laws. Had Stevens been re-elected, he presumably would never have voted for Obamacare, which therefore would have failed by one vote, even if none of the other subsequent abominations, as we will discuss, were forestalled. Second, the Democrats had to succeed in flat-out stealing the election for a Minnesota-based U.S. Senate seat from Republican Norm Coleman. In addition to securing the counting, of highly questionable votes throughout the recount process, the Democrats also likely benefited from the illegal votes of hundreds of felons. Had Coleman been reelected, there is no way he would have voted for Obamacare, which therefore, cue the refrain, would have failed by one vote, even if none of the other subsequent abominations, as we will discuss, were forestalled. Third, although chronologically first, the Washington Post had to succeed in its unprecedentedly and viciously unfair coverage of the U.S. Senate race in Virginia, both capitalizing on Senator George Allen's missteps, he ran a terrible campaign, and skewing the news relentlessly against him even when he didn't make mistakes. Had he not lost by a tiny 8,800 vote margin, there is no way he would have voted for Obamacare, which therefore, cue the refrain, would have failed by one vote even if none of the other subsequent abominations, as we will discuss, were forestalled. Parenthetically, without as direct a link either to skullduggery or to the clearly relevant time frame, would-be Obamacare opponents also likely would have been in office in several other states under ordinary circumstances. In New Jersey, liberal Democrat Frank Lautenberg had returned to the Senate in 02 due to a logically and legally unsupportable state Supreme Court ruling allowing him to replace Robert the Torch Torricelli on the ballot after the legal deadline. In Montana, Republicans shot themselves in the foot in 2006 by not pressuring incumbent Conrad Burns into retirement following his association with the Jack Abramoff scandal. He lost an otherwise safe seat by less than 1% of the vote. And it didn't help that in Oregon, Incumbent Republican Gordon Smith lost another close race largely due to votes siphoned away from him perfectly legitimately but frustratingly by a candidate of the Constitution Party. Fourth, there clearly were good reasons to believe Senators Ben Nelson and Mary Landrieu would refuse to keep the Obamacare legislation alive had it not been for respectively the infamous Cornhusker kickback and Louisiana purchase agreements. Granted, horse trading is always part of politics, uh, that is, Louisiana's John Bro handing a key vote to Ronald Reagan after declaring my vote isn't for sale, but it is for rent. But these special Obamacare deals smell particularly rancid, particularly rancid. For that matter, Democrats had to promise more compromise than they even intended to deliver in order to secure support and committee from Republican Olympia Snow, who voted to keep it alive only to have her hopes forsaken by the final shape of the bill. Yes, the bill would have passed committee anyway, but it's also incontrovertible that some Democrats in both chambers excuse later procedural votes for the package by describing it as bipartisan based solely on Snow's committee vote. Fifth, Harry Reid had to play parliamentary hardball and Mitch McConnell had to let him get away with it in order to force the key vote on initial Senate passage before the Senate left for Christmas break of 09. 
whereas if senators would have gone home for Christmas and heard firsthand the intensity of public opposition, not even the various kickbacks and purchases and other deals would have sufficed to keep some of the senators on board for the one-vote victory. Six, the Senate had to pull other procedural rabbits from its hat in order to make up for not letting the House originate a revenue-raising bill and to make up for the loss of Massachusetts Senate seat to Scott Brown. Chief among these was taking an orphan house bill and stripping everything from the bill but the number, replacing the entire text with the text of Obamacare. Again, this is legal, but hardly an admirable way to force through a bill of this size and importance on a party line vote. Seventh, Arlen Specter abandoned the entire five previous years of his public pledges and posturing, pledges without which he never would have been reelected in 04 by switching parties in a nakedly unprincipled bid to somehow, some way, hold on to power. Had he been running for re-election in a Republican primary rather than a Democratic one, there is no way on earth he would have voted for the health care monstrosity. Eighth, Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid had to orchestrate the most dishonest set of bait-and-switch procedural maneuvers seen in Congress in decades in order to secure shifting bare majorities for elements of Obamacare so as to give their own members various degrees of deniability for passage of the whole, which clearly could not and would not have passed in a straight-up vote without any subterfuge. Ninth, the administration and congressional Democrats had to use major ledger domain to avoid budgetary procedural shoals by mislabeling some spending and double counting some savings in order to claim to be not busting the budget rules that rather clearly were actually being busted. Had the Congressional Budget Office been able to officially and accurately project the bills as budget busters, Democrats would never have been able to muster the supermajorities needed for passage. Tenth, and hang with me, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost to the end, but this was just amazing to me, and I had to share it with you. Tenth, Barack Obama had to twist more arms than a championship wrestler in order to get enough House members in line to bring passage of the bill, even within striking range. Then eleventh, he had to fool enough pro-life Democrats, like I talked about, Stupak, who had to be stupid enough or cynical enough to let themselves be fooled into believing that an executive order from him could carry enough of the force of law to ensure that no public funds would be used for abortions and that his administration would actually observe both the letter and the spirit of that order. The final official House tally was 219 to 212, but the de facto passage was by only one vote. Several of the I votes would not have switched in that direction at the last minute unless they had enough cover to say they weren't the single vote that pushed it over the top. Twelfth, as has been well documented, the administration and Democrats had to argue first that the individual mandate's penalty was not a tax in order to round up congressional votes, and then had to argue in some courts that it was a tax for some purposes, and in other courts that it wasn't a tax for other purposes, and then have to use the it's a tax argument as a Hail Mary afterthought in its Supreme Court argument, even while knowing full well that if they somehow won the case on that basis, they would immediately disavow in public the very argument that they used to win the case. That, therefore, was the rancid sausage John Roberts apparently felt had to salvage in, a, in supposed deference to the sanctity of the legislative process. So, ladies and gentlemen, that, that, uh, when you hear it all together, doesn't it sound a lot worse when you, when you hear the road to this uh, decision is just... Uh, just so dishonest. Uh, it's just uh, amazing that all those things happen and the lack of, uh, of honest reporting uh, just boggles the mind, too. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's going to be hard to take this thing down, too. It is. It's not as easy as uh, Mitt Romney gets elected and signs a, a bill. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff in this thing that's uh, designed to be so complicated that it's going to be hard to hard to knock down. I mean, the document itself is, I think, 2,700 pages, but there's mandates in there and directives in there for the, the chairman of the or director or whatever of the Health and Human Services has to write like 13,000 pages of more regulations that we don't even know what she's going to write yet. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be a tough one to dismantle. I don't know if uh, First things first. I mean, first we have to get the seat of government back uh, in adult hands. I mean, this will change. This will change America completely. I mean, one thing that I do know about it: there's a three percent uh, tax, a sales tax on all real estate transactions. 
you know, so that, that's huge. 3% on a, on a hundred thousand dollar house. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is going to change the, the country. Uh, Rasmussen's paying attention. Uh, he says that conservative anger against Obamacare is hitting stratospheric levels. Conservative interest in the presidential election hit stratospheric levels following last week's Supreme Court ruling upholding Obamacare, noted pollster and author Scott Rasmussen, tells Newsmax TV. All that did was energize conservatives, declared Rasmussen in an exclusive interview on Monday. The conservative interest in the election was already much higher than that of moderates and liberals. It went up to really stratospheric levels right after the ruling. We don't know if that will continue or if, or if it's just a temporary response to the news cycle. Most importantly, he said, Republicans have to make the case that the unpopular Obamacare will be a further drain on America's disappointing economic recovery since the economy still tops the list of voter concerns. So uh, we hope here at the show that the uh, conservative uh, state of energy stays high. We've got three months to go. And uh, we've got to we've got to really bear down. I mean, this is not going to be easy. It's not. I still believe in the end. I don't believe any of these polls that show half of the country supporting Obama. I mean, because that would mean that I don't know how many are voting age. There's 300 some million people in the country. So let's just go with 100 million. And let's say there's 100 million or 150 million voters out there. I cannot imagine that half of those people either a are leftists and are totally down with leftism and socialism and, and, and the government running everything, you know, and, and, and just redistributing wealth and everything like that, or B, they're stupid. You know, I mean, and that's just what it is. That if, if you vote for Obama, you're one of those two things. You're either not paying attention or you're a leftist because that's what you're voting for. You are voting for a man that has surrounded himself with terrorists, racists, uh, anti-police people, Occupy people, um, straight-up communist union people. If you vote for them, that's, that's who you are. Or you're stupid or misinformed. I, I would rather it be misinformed, but uh, to wake up in the morning and, and look at what's going on and, and knowing that your neighbors are out of work and things like that and to not get yourself educated, stupid. Sorry. It's what it is, and I'm, that's what the show's here for. I'm trying to pass the word. Go out and tell these people uh, if you can get if you can get them to listen to you. And a committed leftist, you'll never get to listen to you. So don't even worry about that. I mean, it, you'll see them. I comment on websites, and I commented on a local city councilman's website the other day. And all they could come back with, if, if the word social, even the city councilman came back with, if the word socialism or communism comes into the conversation, it's not even worth you know paying attention to what the rest of the guy says. Well. There's a precedent for communism and socialism, ladies and gentlemen, and it's black and white. When the government owns car companies, when the government controls banks, when the government bails out people and, and does the, the things that they do, and the government sits there and, and just by fiat bypasses Congress and does things by regulation, it's, it is what it is. Uh, so you don't even, don't even worry about them. They're leftists, and they're content in their world, and they think that the, the government ought to control everything from walking on the sidewalk to what you eat to where you go and how you da 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 da. I mean, it's just uh, it's bizarre and, and it's un it's un-American. I mean, if you look at what the founding fathers did uh, to found this country on the principles that they did, um, it's clear that the government is not supposed to be in your life every day. The government is almost you know they have very limited, very limited. Uh, power and very limited mission uh, and it's just gone so far beyond that now uh, so anyway more than half of the country 52 percent of American voters believe that Obamacare should be repealed I can't believe that there's 48 percent of Americans want the government to be in charge of their health care it just blows my mind in key US Senate race races Rasmussen offered these assessments Florida Senator Bill Nelson is struggling to get above the 50% mark. For an incumbent, that's a little bit of a concern. I think Nelson's bigger concern is having Barack Obama at the head of the ticket, Rasmussen said. So for Nelson to keep his job, Barack Obama needs to remain competitive. Nelson is still the slight favorite, but a big Romney victory in Florida could change that. 
Massachusetts Republican Scott Brown is dead even with Democrat uh, Elizabeth Warren. If it were a choice between Scott Brown and Elizabeth Warren, I think Scott Brown would win. But if it's a choice between who controls the U.S. Senate, Republicans or Democrats, then Warren will win. It's still a Democrat-leaning state. Democrat Senator Claire McCaskill is vulnerable in Missouri. In fact, we have her down significantly to each of the Republican competitors. She is a decided underdog, he said. The Obama campaign is not going to put forth a serious effort to try to pick up that state this time around if he was to sense the mood in Missouri. Among all the incumbent senators out there, Claire McCaskill is the one most closely tied to the Obama administration. Democrat incumbent John Tester's race in Montana is still too close to call against Republican Denny Reberg. These are two guys who have held office statewide. They both, uh, they're both very well known, according to Rasmussen. It is one of the races that you can't call right now, and the way it, that it goes will determine control of the U.S. Senate. Virginia's Senate race is also too close to call between Democrat Timothy Kane and Republican fellow former Governor George Allen. Both men are well known in the state, said Rasmussen. I believe that whichever party wins Virginia in the presidential race, whichever party walks away with those electoral college votes will also walk away with that Senate seat. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. The conservative fervor has reached stratospheric levers from uh, levels from Scott Rasmussen. Uh, now, this is probably the, the July 4th Independence Day episode, so I wanted to I wanted to take a walk down the street here with you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Joel Pollack penned an article, and it uh, basically has outlined some of the things that have already been done. It's titled, Our President is No Patriot. On this 4th of July, we should remember just how little President Barack Obama cares for America. He does not believe the United States is an exceptional nation in any unique sense. He refused to wear a flag pin as a gesture of dissent from national pride. He worshipped at a church that damns the country, and neither he nor his wife were proud of America until fellow Democrats elevated them to the top of the political heap. Though the Declaration of Independence broke firmly with a foreign monarch, President Obama has eagerly bowed to foreign kings and emperors. He has abdicated America's leadership in the world and instead submitted our freedom to the deceit decrepit judgment of the world's dictators. Just this week, he apologized to a country whose soldiers opened fire on our own and which protected America's greatest enemy for years. Pakistan, he's talking about. President Obama does not believe that he serves us. He believes that Americans serve him, especially those in uniform, whom he describes as fighting on my behalf. His main ambition has been to make Americans more dependent on government particularly the executive branch, whether in the care we receive from our doctors or the very food we put into our bodies. He demonizes or bullies into submission those who might defy him. So little does Barack Obama care for the United States that he has eagerly undermined the nation's unity in an attempt to hold on to power, casting aside the motto of E Pluribus Unum, which he once pretended to embrace. Though his ascent reflects the unique reality of the American dream, he seeks to destroy that dream for others, punishing success and urging those who have not yet succeeded to blame their fellow citizens and sign up for food stamps. I added that. The cloistered, comfortable, and radical class from which President Obama derives his core political ideas believes that the only thing that is special about the United States is its wealth. They do not see that wealth as the outcome of a morally and economically superior system that values individual freedom above all. They see it as a moral burden that emerges from an ongoing history of slavery, exploitation, and imperialism. They see the islands of poverty that persist in an ocean of prosperity as an indictment of the nation as a whole, a problem not to be addressed among citizens themselves, but by revolutionizing the entire system, system of government. They ensure that they themselves will be the chief beneficiaries, materially and politically, of the changes they impose, then dare to accuse their opponents of acting from motives of greed and self-interest. And with all the unprecedented power President Obama has amassed, he refuses to execute the duly constituted and passed laws of Congress, and worse, he presses the Supreme Court to rewrite those laws by fiat. 
If Americans once looked to the judiciary as the last guardians of liberty, we now see the justices as politicians, acting to protect themselves and their masters rather than the liberties of our Constitution. The philosopher John Locke, whose ideas nourished the revolution, wrote that the government had dissolved itself when he who has the supreme executive power neglects and abandons that charge, and when there is no longer the administration of justice. This July 4th, we must conclude that we have reached that point, and the only answer is the removal in this November's election of the would-be tyrant who has made it so. Well said, sir. That was a, a very uh, sad piece, but, but true nonetheless. Uh, and and like, I, like I said before, the, uh, some of these things that are going on uh, right now, uh, for instance, in Libya, I mean, in Libya... We, we, I chronicled last week, or two weeks ago, I can't remember, the uh, associations that Hillary Clinton, and more specifically Hillary Clinton's aide, uh, or chief of staff, or whatever she is, uh, Weinstein's, Wiener's, Wiener's wife. Uh, and that's a whole, a whole new show right there on, on why she married him. Uh, so we have uh, a daughter of... A member, a, a very high-ranking member of the Muslim Sisterhood, uh, that is right next to our Secretary of State at all times. And now you have Libyan elections, where the Muslim Brotherhood is set to lead the government. Uh, Libya's top politicians—they've hatched a deal that would see the Muslim Brotherhood lead the government after the country's first free election in almost five decades takes place on Saturday. And supporters of the Justice and Construction Party, the political arm of the Libyan Muslim Brotherhood celebrated the end of the election campaign in Tripoli. <laughs> so while the elections for a 200-member National Congress is unlikely to grant a majority to any one faction, the Muslim Brotherhood and its Islamist allies are confident they can join their counterparts in Tunisia and Egypt at the helm of leadership. Negotiations between the Muslim Brotherhood and a secular-based political movement led by four interim prime minister former interim prime minister Mahmoud Jabril have focused on forming a post-election government as soon as the result is known. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood would dominate the ministries. In the run-up to the elections, Libya's interim government has struggled to maintain law and order, uh, threatened electoral boycott by federalists in Benghazi, the second city, has rattled Libya's rebels tur rebel turned leaders, leading figures to fear that the large numbers in the city that triggered the rebellion against Mark, Muammar Gaddafi may shun the polls, undermining legitimacy of the election. So that's uh, that's something that we're going to have to keep our eyes on. Um, but it's amazing to me that the government, that the administration, would so quickly would be so quick to embrace these monsters. I mean, they have to have the intelligence. I have the intelligence, so they have to have the intelligence. They have to know that the Muslim Brotherhood was Hitler's Muslim wing. And that's not rhetoric, and that's not calling somebody a Nazi. That's that's what happened. The leader, and you knew you you heard about it on this show if you if you've been listening to the show for a while. The Grand Mufti of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in the 1930s collaborated with Adolf Hitler in Germany and spent the war years in Berlin. That happened. There's pictures of it. There's there's documentation of it. Uh so to even be anywhere near these people is just beyond me. It's bizarre. And again, the media is failing in all, you know, on all cylinders. It's just, uh, it's something else. And it brings me my next couple segments here. And this, this, is, ha this is happy time here. I'm enjoying reporting this. This is, uh, this is good. NBC News executives deny David Gregory is out at Meet the Press. <laughs> Moderator David Gregory Appears with Chuck Todd, and uh, that's a picture caption. This week, the iPad news service, The Daily, ran a report that Gregory was right behind Curry in the NBC News tumbrel. The report about Gregory is not new. It surfaced a couple months ago. At that time, Joe Scarborough was said to be his replacement. But stone-cold denials were issued by Meet the Press executive producer Betsy Fisher and NBC News president Steve Kappas. Another stone-cold denial was issued this week. The rumors recklessly reported by the Daily are categorically untrue, NBC News said in a statement. How can you believe anything that NBC News says? I mean, really, I can't believe they still are meeting payroll, these people. Uh, <laughs> 
even the Daily reported that Meet the Press anchor Tim Russert was spinning in his grave over the show's numbers. Russert ruled the Sunday Beltway show ratings until his sudden death in June of 2008. I used to like watching him because he put it right up there on the screen. Uh, last month, Meet the Press's weekly rating hit a 20-year low among viewers between the ages of 25 and 54, the currency of news programming. I'm telling you, that's good. On the, last, on the first Sunday of June, the public affairs show averaged 2.46 million total viewers of all ages, but just 687,000 viewers in that key age bracket, which was its smallest 25 to 54 demographic performance for a regular broadcast since July of 92. Meet the Press got beaten in the demographic by ABC's News this week that week, the first time they bested both Gregory's show and CBS's Face the Nation in two years. But NBC News' bigger Sunday problem isn't ABC's show or its returned host, George Stephanopoulos. It's CBS's Bob Schieffer. Schieffer hosts Face the Nation, which this season is snapping at Meet the Press's heels. Since the 2011-12 TV season began in mid-September, Schieffer's show has snared the largest audience among the Sunday public affairs show, a total of 18 times in contrast for the year spanning mid-September of 10 to 11, Schieffer's show finished first uh, just three times. Since mid-September of 11, NBC's Meet the Press is averaging 3 million viewers, while Face the Nation is averaging 2.93. And it just goes on and on and on about different statistics and, and whatnot. Uh, Face the Nation has been booking, producing, and promoting a one-hour broadcast for several months now, but they continue to only report ratings data for the first half hour. So they're, uh, I mean, I, I like seeing these people in decay. I wish they would wake up, you know, wake up and, and just one day say, you know what, we got to hire, we got to get rid of half these people uh, and hire conservatives for the other half and then at least talk about issues like Fox does, have, have you know, different people at the table uh, or something. But it goes on, it gets better than that. Imperialism and genocide the 4th of July, according to MSNBC. Now, I was going to get the clip of this, uh, and maybe for the, for the audio listeners, I will. So let's listen to this clip. Now, for those of you that are watching the show live or on video, you're not going to get the clip. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what this uh, next reporter did. It's really uh, something else. Uh, I mean, when you finished reading with this story, we'd be surprised if you didn't end up with a pessimistic query. I mean, is there anything MSNBC can cover without spoiling it? The answer, as it turns out, may be no. Uh, let's get right to the text of this thing, if I can find. NBC is letting their resident Jeremiah Wright admire Melissa Harris Perry say things like this, according to Mediate. And what is sure to rankle the feathers of many conservatives MSNBC weekend host Melissa Harris Perry took to her show Sunday to ponder the meaning of Independence Day, highlighting mostly the stains on American history. It's ours, all of it, she said. The imperialism, the genocide, the slavery, also the liberation and the hope of the deeply American belief that our best days still lie ahead of us. Independence Day is more aspirational than actual, she began her monologue. We have long defined the American dream with commodities a home of one's own, better education for the kids, family vacation and a car to, the va to, to take the vacation in. And if we measure the dream by acquisitions, we're in trouble. National unemployment remains above 8%. I'm a, amazed that they admitted that on NBC. Wages have dropped and the median net worth of American families plummeted by almost 40%. And she continued on to explain that her favorite story for this, this is, this is stunning, this part. Her favorite story for this 4th of July is one of people who are not technically free. She described a group of 27 inmates who recently completed their GEDs at the jail on Rikers Island. Despite being incarcerated, they hold fast to the optimistic belief that education, hard work, and second chances are still stuff of America and that they have a right to take part in the dream. 
So on the 4th of July, Harris Perry concluded, I'm going to think of the Rikers Island graduates, and I'm going to wave a flag without hesitation, not because I've forgotten my nation's many wrongs, but because I remember them, and I am nonetheless proud of my country, not for its perfection, because the alternative is too grim. The alternative is to give up on the dream of the nation founded in the belief, if not yet the practice, that all are created, all deserve freedom, and all have the right to pursue happiness. Now that is a dream worth celebrating with fireworks. I mean, that's what you put on on 4th of July. Uh, this next, <laughs> NBC, it's time for you to go away. <laughs> it's time for you to go bankrupt. Oh, my goodness. Uh, this next story I'm not going to have time to really get into, but uh, something's happening in California that should really make your, it should show you. Uh, California is doing something that Fidel Castro did in 1959. California municipalities may seize private property to redo mortgages. So basically what they want to do is there are several cities in California uh, that are using their eminent domain power, which I don't know about. I don't think eminent domain. I, I'd like to see some legislation blocking some of these uses of eminent domain because if you don't have the right to private property, you don't have a country. Not a country that was founded like we know it. I mean, so they're taking, they're basically what they're doing is they're, they're taking a house that's underwater. Just use some numbers here. They're taking a house that a guy bought for $200,000 and with the mortgage boom and the real estate boom, it's now, and he still owes $160,000 on his mortgage for $200,000. And now the house is only worth $110,000. So what they're doing is, is they want to seize these houses these mortgages, and they want to give them back to the guy at the value of the house now. So the bank's out. You know what I mean? The bank loses its money. This guy, you know, the answer is, you know, you, you're the one that bought the house. You signed a note. It's like college loans, like I talked about last week. Uh, if you enter into a contractual agreement with somebody and you borrow money, then you're responsible for that money. You know, it doesn't matter what else happens. Uh, you should have had mortgage insurance, or, or you should have uh, uh, paid a little bit more attention. I'm sorry that the value of the house is lower than it was when you bought it. That's uh, You should have seen that coming. I mean, but anyway, so that's what they're doing in, in uh, California. They're, they're actually using eminent domain to screw the banks. Again, the financial instruments that uh, gave people the ability to purchase homes. So I think that's pretty... Uh, that's pretty chilling to me. I mean, it really was. That, that's, that's something that just... Uh, okay, the last story of the week, ladies and gentlemen. I said this is the July 4th Independence Day edition, but something else happened on July 4th. July 4th was also... And you'll, you won't hear this on the news. That's why it has to be on, on the resistance. July 4th was also the 36th anniversary, anniversary of the Israeli raid on Entebbe. Brigadier General... Joshua Shani, July 4th, 2012, was the 36th anniversary of the breathtaking Israeli raid on Entebbe that freed 105 hostages in Uganda, but lost one Israeli soldier, Jonathan Netanyahu, the brother of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Here are some excerpts of an interview about the raid with Brigadier General Reserve Joshua Shani, who was the lead pilot in Operation Entebbe. On June 27, 1976, a Paris-bound Air France flight from Tel Aviv via Athens was hijacked and diverted to Entebbe, Uganda. Two of the hijackers were members of the German Bader Meinhof gang, and two were from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They demanded the release of 53 jailed terrorists in Israel. Jonathan Yanni Netanyahu, on the third day of the crisis, the terrorists separated Israeli and Jewish passengers from the others. The captors freed the non-Jews and sent them to France the next day. Quietly, while the rest of the world talked but did nothing, the IDF planned a rescue mission. Through the eyes of Brigadier General Shani, we began our journey from Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, which at the time was under Israeli control. The takeoff from Sharm was one of the heaviest ever in the history of this airplane. I didn't have a clue what would happen. The aircraft was crowded. I was carrying the Sayeret Matkal assault team, led by Yonatan Netanyahu. I was also carrying a Mercedes, which was supposed to confuse Ugandan soldiers at the airport, because Idi Amin, the country's dictator, had the same car. 
and I also found room to pack Land Rovers and a paratrooper force. We had to fly very close to Saudi Arabia and Egypt over the Gulf of Suez. We weren't afraid of violating anyone's airspace. It's an international air route. The problem was that they might pick us up on radar. We flew really low, 100 feet above the water, a formation of four planes. The main element was surprise. All it takes is one truck to block a, one, a runway, and that's all. The operation would be over. Therefore, secrecy was critical. At some places that were, act, that were particularly dangerous, we flew at an altitude of 35 feet. I recall the altimeter reading. Trust me, this is scary. In this situation, you cannot fly close formation. As flight leader, I don't know if I still had planes 2, 3, and 4 behind me because there was total radio silence. You can't see behind you in a C-130. The crew of the C-130 that landed at Entebbe, Joshua Shani, is in the center of the front row. I stopped in the middle of the runway and a group of paratroopers jumped out from the side doors and marked the runway with electric lights so that the other planes behind me could have an easier time landing. The paratroopers went on to take the control tower. The Mercedes and Land Rovers drove out from the back cargo door of my airplane and the commandos stormed the old terminal building where the hostages were. While coordinating the assault, Yonatan Netanyahu, Sayuret Matkal's commander, was fatally shot by a Ugandan soldier. And uh, th this is an excellent reenactment of the near-perfect raid uh, and rescue operation. I remember it well. It makes you wonder why Jimmy Carter didn't allow our military to do the same thing in Iran. Uh, but anyway, as with all the stories on Steel City Resistance, you can go to steelcityresistance.wordpress.com, and uh, one of the pages, there's only two pages yet, and one of them is the show notes links, and you can get that story in its entirety, get every story, uh, with you know the full content of the actual article online, the photos and the, any videos that are associated with that article, a lot of them are. A lot of them have video, so uh, that's why we do that. Uh, let's see. I'd, I'd like you to. I'd like to get some more likes on our Facebook page. Uh, there's still a lot of people putting things on there. Still, or uh, Facebook.com/slash Steel City Resistance, and I've been up in my my posts there. Uh, so that's a good place to go. Go there and like it. Uh, Freedom Connector, join our, our uh, group, Steel City Resistance, on Freedom Connector. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Pittsburgh Pirates are doing good. The half, first half of the, M of the MLB season just ended today, and, and we're doing real well. Again, thanks to Lloyd Marcus. Uh, you can uh, email the show at scrtv at live.com, and I'll try to get back with you if you have some content. Uh, you can also post on, on Steel City Resistance Facebook page. Feel free to go on there, all you 53 people or however many are following that. Uh, if you find something uh, that you find interesting, go ahead and put it on the timeline. I'm pretty sure you can. I know you can. Uh, so that's uh, a good place to to vent sometimes like I do. You can follow SCRPGH on Twitter. Uh, there's not That really hasn't taken off yet. Uh, you can follow me, Berg's Eye View. Make sure there's an H at the end of the Berg, a Berg's Eye View at Twitter. Uh, I'll tell you, if you, if you don't want to hear some uh, cutting-edge stuff and, and also things about the Pirates, maybe, ladies and gentlemen, or the Steelers or whatever, uh, you might not want to do that. But I, I also tweet a lot, but I'm I'm starting to confine a lot of that. I uh, quit lying. No, I'm not. I'm putting stuff on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, but I appreciate all the all the people that listened to the show last week. And I'm going to watch this and see if this continues uh, because I'm not going to do it uh, for nobody to listen to it. But if the, if the show gets downloaded, tell your friends about it. Try to pass it around a little bit. Uh, I'll keep doing it if people keep listening or watching. Uh, it, it's, it's fun, but it's, it's kind of tough talking for a straight hour. Uh, but I'll do it for you, ladies and gentlemen. I will. Uh, so like I said, I gave you the email address. Uh, you can call the show at... Uh, 412-254-3750 and keep it under two minutes and if it's relevant I'll play it on the show that's no problem uh, thanks for letting me into your life for an hour your lives for one hour I know that's a lot I know I didn't get the email responses that I was expecting however I went and looked at the stats and the vast majority of people that listen to the show listen to it on iTunes so you're probably not near your computer. I, I know that's happened to me. I'll listen to a podcast on my iPhone 
when I'm out walking or, or doing something like that, I'm nowhere near a computer, and I'm not doing it on the on the on the phone. I mean, some of you do the some of you uh, do that all the time. So feel free to email the show if you have uh, any suggestions or uh, complaints or comments or or anything like that. Uh, again, thank you to 100 million patriots standing from Logan, Ohio. We appreciate you listening to the program, and uh, that's all I have. So until next week, God bless you and. Uh, Keep your powder dry.